social activist, primarily in the field of gender equality, but also in justice, housing, uh, the environment, and in business. So I'm an entrepreneur and investor with a particular focus on racial and gender equity and influencing financial systems. I'm an environmental scientist, a specialist on complex systems. I've been working for more than 50 years trying to bring science and ethics, value, spirituality together. I've been an advisor to the World Bank, World Economic Forum. I was in the United Nations for many years. And business has to play its role, which is why what we're doing here is so important. The role of business is multifaceted. For example, it provides jobs for people. It enables them to build, develop their own skills. It develop, enables them to develop their own families, to take care of themselves. Uh, it says in the Baha'i writings that one of the purposes of work is for ourselves to be able to carry the burden of others and not to be a burden ourselves. So there's something also around the social justice that a good job, well-paid job, a fair job uh, is, and that business creates those opportunities for people to enter into the economic world fairly and with uh, dignity. I think a lot about the idea in the Baha'i writings to build off what Wendy shared of the, there's a, a passage that says work performed in the spirit of service can today be accounted as an act of worship. The idea that actually how we engage with our work, no matter what role that may be, um, is a form of worship. And so that the, the level of both awareness and engagement and intentionality creates even more importance on what does that mean in terms of the organizations that we're, we're part of or the, the role that business can play in society. A big challenge for this today is that having spent many decades uh, exploiting the resources of the planet, how do we regenerate the resources of the planet? How do we restore things that have been damaged? How do we fit back into the natural systems that have made, made this planet livable? So business has to rethink its role in, in terms of building a better world for the future and not simply exploiting it for short-term gain. And that, that's the, the real challenge facing the, the reorientation needed in society. Then it can, we can all work together to address the problems that are threatening us. Business can play a really powerful role in contributing towards the transformation of society. And when I think about the role of business, it reminds me of the role of technology, which in and of itself can be used for both good or bad, but the power of intentionality of everyone within a business thinking about what are ways within our role, within our products, our services, can we look at ways of contributing towards the betterment of the world and thus of transforming society. And it reminds me of a, a quotation from the Universal House of Justice, which is a central body in the, in the Baha'i faith that says, every choice we make as employee or employer, producer or consumer, borrower or lender, benefactor or beneficiary leaves a trace. And the moral duty to lead a coherent life demands that one's economic decisions be in accordance with lofty ideals, that the purity of one's aims be matched by the purity of one's actions to fulfill those aims. So this powerful example of it's not just the, the CEOs and founders of an organization that can look at how the businesses can transform society, but really everybody within an organization that can um, sort of hold that mantle. It has a critical role to play because if you look at the, the globalized world of today, you have governments and the whole international system, the system of states, you know, national sovereignty, multilateralism and so on at the, the governmental level, but it has very little impact on the economy and on business. I mean, I've worked with the United Nations for decades and we've done lots of wonderful things in the monastery to plan for better environmental future and sustainability and so on. Implementation fails because there's no international legislation or framework for business. In the sense we've institutionalized you know, an ancient view of humanity as naturally selfish and aggressive, we built those values into the very structure of corporations where they're held responsible for being greedy, and endless growth, more and more wealth. And so I think we actually say, how can business question its own ethical foundations, change from being part of the problem to part of the solution. If we could convince businesses to incorporate in their legal charters an obligation for social and environmental responsibility, 
and to be of some kind of good service to humanity, and with profit as one measure of efficiency among others, that would allow them to focus on a larger perspective than just making more and more wealth. I think so. Business has to take responsibility for rethinking its its fundamental purpose. Some of the pillars that are are of society themselves are some very uh, fundamental concepts, values, and as you might say, ethics that really sustain the way our world is. And they're not just principles that are interesting to have on a wall or you have them behind you, but they're really drivers, the attitudes that we have. And because of those attitudes, the behaviors that we have. So if we think about, for example, the concept of the oneness of humanity and the way in which business already at the international level reflects that oneness, they're global, they work in every country, they touch every person, uh, they are, uh, their workforce is international, uh, they, in, they embody you know, a whole global system and network of interrelationships. And yet we still don't think about the people who are working in those businesses as being one people living on one planet. So some, and therefore you get these disparities, for example, in pay, whether it's the gender pay gap, or the racial pay gap. So thinking in a global way doesn't necessarily provide this concept of we are one people living on one planet and we all deserve dignity. We deserve to have, uh, the, you know, people deserve to have a living wage. They deserve to have health and safety at work and so forth. And these are some of the things that get certain, somehow neglected uh, when we have corporations or businesses which think globally, but not about the people who, who they're serving. So that's one dimension for me. Another dimension really is um, something that Jenna mentioned about everything leaves a trace. No matter what we do for good or ill, it has an effect somewhere in the world for people. And here's the trace that I think we should be thinking about leaving. And that's the concept of justice and equity. How do we embody in our system, something that is fair, something that is just for everyone, not simply beneficial to one segment of the community, one segment of society, one segment of humanity, but really is beneficial to all people. All of those need to have justice. And that justice is also based not only on the concept of the oneness of humanity, but also on the concepts of honesty honest trading, trustworthiness, fulfilling of contracts, paying people fairly, being able to have justice within the workplace as well as outside the workplace. Um, and again, that's another basic concept, which you know seems nice when you put it up on a wall, we believe in justice, but how does it operationalize itself? And this is what really uh, people within a company, uh, whether they're you know, the weather on the board, whether the CEO, whether the, the person who comes and cleans the factory, whatever it is, every single one of those people to be involved in understanding what justice within the workplace means and within that business means and how it affects the wider society and all the other stakeholders. I wanted to also bring in the concept of gender equality because too infrequently, we have very few women in positions of leadership within corporations. It's growing, it's changing, but it's still not equitable. And not only don't we have enough women, we don't have enough men who understand the concept of leadership in a different way. If we understand leadership to be power, power over, and the way that we get there is by being aggressive, beating out, having being competitive, getting to the top, we value being at the top more than we value being the person contributes the most. So even the very structures of our businesses, and I may say our politics and just about everything else, relies on this very different idea than I might have and the EBF itself has about what leadership looks like, which is collaborative, which is consultative, where the decisions are made across the entire organization, where everyone's opinion and concepts and ideas are valued because they have knowledge, they know, and they have experience, they know what they're doing, they have something to contribute to that. 
And those things are very often not found uh, just in the top leadership of people who've come up through competitive systems, but actually people who are doing the work on the ground and have come up because they are collaborative and because they are able to work together and they're able to build the unity of the company and have strong relationships within it so that everyone is cared for, everyone is con everyone within the company is cared for, but also everyone outside the company that they're serving. What could we do differently? That conversation has to happen. And if we have women and men who understand these same qualities, I don't want to call them feminine qualities, but these same qualities of caring, nurturance, and many men do, many, many men do. Uh, if we have more of those kinds of leaders rather than ones who are bottom line, competitive, and dare I say it, aggressive, uh, we would have not only better companies, we'd have a better world. So I work at, at Impact Experience when the co-founder and CEO is really focused on building bridges between investors, entrepreneurs, and communities that have been overlooked and underestimated. And a big part of the work is grounding in the historical context around structural racism, around gender equity and looking at ways in which that's playing out to today in terms of how businesses function and how they engage with communities that have been overlooked and underestimated. And this importance of acknowledging that history and present day reality in that process of building trust or, or moving forward from uh, the, this sort of harrowing past um, becomes a really important aspect. You know, Wendy had mentioned around the importance of honesty. And I think that this element of like honesty within ourselves within our own organizations and um, as to some of that damage that has been done in the past to be able to then as we're moving forward and we're trying to build organizations that are based on principles of of justice that that can be done in a truly equitable way and particularly in terms of the engagement with communities that it's done truly like building power with rather than for um, and I think a lot about that the line where it talks about don't just give a man a fish teach him how to fish um, but actually it's even more than that of how do we reduce the barriers that have prevented people who know how to fish from being able to fish right? and the, that's the case with so many of these these communities that have been marginalized is that there's so much wealth and wisdom that lies within these communities but but there hasn't been the opportunity for that to to truly shine and i think one of the things that's been so powerful over the past couple of years it post the the murder of george floyd and with covid is that all of this structural inequity has become so much more apparent that the power the role of businesses no longer being able to just stay uh in the background but actually and we see this with all the, the companies and investors that are making commitments around you know, racial and gender equity and now really being held accountable for those commitments that have been made. And I also think that there are, to this point around governance, and we work with a lot of organizations who are exploring how this plays out within their work, of looking at different models in terms of employee ownership and profit sharing. And uh, I think now the role of blockchain and DAOs and how do we actually create a more uh, less hierarchical structures within organizations and what are the tools that can help to facilitate the ability for us to actualize some of those goals that uh, you weren't there as, as much in the past and are now here in a way that um, it's hard for organizations to uh, sort of stay in the closet around these around these topics. So I think it's a really exciting moment in time and we certainly see you know a lot of work with impact experience a lot of organizations that are, um, are wanting to, to do things in a different way. whole challenge is how do we give business a moral framework and not just a materialist economic framework. There's a lovely quote from the Universal House of Justice, the international governing body of the Baha'i faith, in which they say there is an inherent moral dimension to the generation, distribution, and utilization of wealth and resources. The stresses emerging out of the long-term process of transition from a divided world to knotted one are being felt within international relations as much as in the deepening fractures that affect societies large and small. With prevailing modes of thought found to be badly wanting, the world is in desperate need of a shared ethic, a shared framework 
for addressing the crises that gather like storm clouds. I mean, you see some of those storm clouds are breaking now, we, you know, are getting worse and worse. So I think that the, the time when business could simply do their thing and see social problems as externalities for somebody else to work about, that, that time is gone. We have to recognize that business must become part of society. And there are many good examples, like Jen has just shared, examples of businesses that are really doing the right thing, motivated to be of service. But there are still many, unfortunately, often the largest, who've gotten too far away from any individual's moral principles to affect the behavior of the organization. What is the role of government to provide a framework you know, of the protecting the common good, as opposed to the, 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 the selfish view of any particular individual or company only out looking at its the particular interest, not the interest of the whole. So there's a balance that needs to be struck. We need innovation. We need creativity. How do we bring together these elements of society, each playing their role in terms of increasing the well-being and, and, and welfare of the whole? It also means that we need to use different kinds of indicators. The financial indicator is one tool that talks about a certain kind of financial efficiency. But we also need other measures of how any activity or corporation contributes to, to human well-being. Is it, is it improving people's health? Is it, a, you know, is it providing some form of, of education? Is it building capacity of people in their own workers within the company and in their service to society? So it's creating that larger framework of ethics and values and principles that can become, that the business can buy and say, we are also going to live by these. This is part of becoming part of a united world society in our diversity, helping to advance what all society needs together. That's where business should fit in as part of this beautiful future that we can create for ourselves and for young generations in particular. The things that, that particularly interest me and therefore I know about are not these big corporations, big companies, but actually the ones that are working, that are being developed you know, at a more local and neighborhood level that really have read the reality, if you like, of their own communities and have seen the needs. And, you know, we, we've just come through a two year period of COVID where many people have been locked down, where they weren't able to go to work or the kinds of work that they had has now disappeared. Uh, you know, there's been many, many struggles of people. And yet we saw a huge amount of innovation during that period. What I would call small businesses, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial businesses coming into being that actually supplied the need of people who were um, you know, unable to access other products, were unable to go out shopping and so forth. And that has just sort of carried on. So I'm thinking really of the, this, this um, relationship between a community, the businesses that supply it, and, the, and the, the governance systems that exist in that community as well. And also I'll add the concept of philanthropy, because I think that's another dimension which we're seeing emerging. Uh, and that, that is, for example, I'm just thinking of a small of a business that my friend has had for a long time, which she had to transform during COVID, medium-sized business, employees, you know, several hundred people, one of the things that they've had to do, what they've done is that they decided that they wanted to have an, an aspect of their work that actually fulfilled the exact needs of the people for in, in the community in which they were serving, rather than something larger. So there was there are different dimensions to this. Part of this was philanthropy. Part of this was actually asking people what they wanted to learn and what they wanted to learn as a skill. And how do you skill people to work in a business where they have apparently no skills, but actually have a desire to do that. And at a small scale, she was able to, to achieve that. And now there's a philanthropic wing part of a fund, which we've created to enable people to get on the ladder of training. And it mostly directed at women, because that's the group that lost many in our area, lost uh, these, these, these jobs. And one of the things that that does is it says, do you need somebody to look after your children when you go for an interview? Do you need a suit to buy, some clothes to buy to go to an interview? Do you need help in filling out the forms? 
do you have to have an internet connection? Do you need that if you haven't got it? You know, we're really looking not at the top people who are already have all the skills and have already got that, but how do you enable people who have been disbarred from entering the workforce, from, um, from being part of that? And part of this model uh, of <laughs> skilling up was taken from the Olympic build here in London in 2012. And what the, I won't mention his name, although I know him very well, the person who was responsible for that did in, in a part of London that was derelict and considered to be poor and so forth, and in, you know had to rebuild an entire environment. One of the things he did was to go door to door, meeting the people in the area and saying, I'm going to be building this huge park right next to you. What do you think? And people were very worried about it because they thought that their homes would be demolished, their roads and infrastructure would go. And he said, what would you like to contribute towards this enterprise? And the one that made me really happy was that it was mostly in the area that particular one was a, a, of Muslim women from a particular part of the world, didn't really have the opportunity to learn to speak English. But they decided they like to do is to be caterpillar drivers, you know, the ones that actually sit on these big caterpillar machines and, uh, and be drivers of that because it was a really honorable job. It was fun. They could learn a new skill. And so he had a whole team of these women who previously had no contribution to make to the economy, learning something that nobody ever dreamt they would want to learn. Uh, learning how to dig up an entire environment. And because they were doing it, people accepted that this was the transformation of their needs. And then they had a skill that they could move on and sell. And that's the sort of inspiration um, I think my friend took as well. That And that's the kind of joining up of various factors that seem to be, um, that's kind of emerging in small ways as well as large ways. the size of businesses. Should they always be getting bigger and bigger? Because when they get too big, they lose touch with the human dimension. <clears throat> we should be saying, what is the optimal size for an economic activity? And, and, and rather than getting bigger and bigger, maybe it should spin off new others. That's what happens in biology. You, have, you reproduce and you have children and they go off and do wonderful things. So <clears throat> if we rethink the whole economic framework, with a different set of principles. And the Baha'i National Community has, has talked about this, that one, we should start with a social purpose, you know, doing something that is of good, you know, to society in some way, that there should be altruistic and cooperative, not, you know, always thinking of yourself, but working with others and working together. It should create meaningful employment for everyone because everybody has a right to contribute. And so rather than just finding the most productive workers and firing everybody else, or the cheapest workers and exploiting them. It's like, how can we find something that each person can contribute to this economic activity and put together? I mean, I've worked with, with coral reefs, with all kinds of species. Some are very, very productive and fast and so on. Others are just doing the last little bit, but they're adding something to the wealth of the whole. Everybody can make a contribution. So changing that framework from one of you know, just profit to how do we get everybody involved and then, of course, we should also be eliminating poverty in the world. So how can we generate wealth so that every single person can get at least the minimum they need to live a productive life? If business had those as the guiding principles for setting up the business, say, we've become, we're big enough now. We're at an appropriate human scale. There's no more efficiency economies of scale are getting any bigger. We can divide hive off, help others to set up similar businesses that work alongside us and so on. That would be a, a way of business becoming a constructive part of a society of the future at a scale that is still in touch with human beings and human values, the kinds of things that, that Wendy was talking about. One of the things that's been really exciting to see over the last 10 to 15 years is the rise of the whole field of impact investing and the this is investing into businesses with a goal isn't just about maximizing financial return, but also having a social and environmental impact. And at the honor of working with one of the pioneers in this space, the Calvert Funds, a $15 billion fund in this space. And, and you know, when they first started in the 70s and 80s, 
that they were literally laughed out of Wall Street offices because these, these ideas of a double or triple bottom line were considered to be crazy. And now those same financial institutions are competing for talent because their, their, their clients with the intergenerational wealth transfer that's taking place are demanding more and more product that is more socially responsible. And so seeing this really across a whole broad range of different types of institutions that are um, no longer at the end of the year when they're reporting on their financial returns, like actually integrating into those returns uh, with their social and environmental impact and their investors requiring that. And um, the SEC just last week here in the US um, made a requirement that companies had to report on their carbon uh, and, and climate exposure. And so it's, it's just powerful to see these sort of systemic shifts that makes it sort of no longer possible for companies to, um, to not be considering you know, so many of these dimensions within their core business operations. And there's a line in the Baha'i writings that says, be anxiously concerned with the age in which you live. And this idea that you know, businesses are in a really powerful role to be able to be both anxiously concerned and to be able to respond and engage and to create opportunities for actually recognizing and acknowledging the inherent dignity of people and that interplay and this is a big part of our work at impact experience that interplay with between our own personal deep work to engage around these topics and then how that then plays out in terms of the decisions that we make we you know, do a lot of work with organizations and looking at hiring and retaining diverse talent how do we think about board selection and ensuring that there's diversity within boards that and that isn't done in just a way that's tokenism but that it's actually uh, something that when then decision making processes take place that consultation is happening and you do have the celebration of other ways of thinking about the topics rather than the stifling of those voices so I think the the tools that we now have at our disposal the the broader sort of shifts of integration that we're seeing in the world um, is uh, it's exciting to see that and an exciting moment of time to be a you know, part of, of some of these organizations.